Welcome, good afternoon everybody. I'm really happy to um, invite you to spend the next hour with us for the official launch of the um, Extractive Sector uh, Species Protection Code of Conduct. My name is Carolyn Jewell and I'm the Senior Biodiversity Manager from Heidelberg Cement um, and it's my honour to be invited to uh, take you through the, through the next hour and celebrate this occasion with you. So, um, we're going to start, uh, so we can get a feel for who's online. I can see the participants here, but, but so we know who's joining us. We're going to start with a quick menti poll. Um, so, if you can have a look for those that are joining us virtually at your chat, you will see the, um, the details to connect. Um, please go on, uh, and there's just a simple question as to who are you? Who do you represent? So, the options are NGO, industry, and policymaker. So please log on, lock who you are. We've got a very good industry representation in the room, uh, just for those that, that aren't with us to let you know, which is really good. Uh, we've got a couple of policymakers and NGO representation. So there's uh, quite, quite a variety here. And it seems that there's a lot of interest from the industry, which is really good. After all, these, these are the people that this is really affecting, so it's really good to get your buy-in. So I really am talking to my colleagues today, so that's great. Thank you again for everyone for, for joining. So, to kick us off, um, I'm really honoured uh, that um, Humberto Delgado Rosa has joined us today, if I can invite you up. He's the Director for Natural, Cap Natural Capital um, at DG Environment. Um, and uh, if I can invite you just to say a few words, that'd be lovely. Thank you. I'll say with a lot of pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, for inviting me, and uh, thank you, Caroline, for moderating. Um, actually, Having a code of conduct like this done together between industry and one of the leading um, NGOs uh, on species protection as bird life is very telling. And it's very telling on several grounds. Um, the first ground is uh, a, cooperative pro a cooperative approach is the way to go. This is how one can really, starting from different, very different uh, worldviews of looking into the subject, find a way, the legal way, the viable way, and the way to get um, uh, better results for the both sides of the equation, the environment and uh, the economy. It's also good on, on a more specific sense, which is, I would say, the European Green Deal sense. It is still there, alive and kicking, the Green Deal. And I would say uh, this Green Deal, uh, the main, uh, one of the main elements is, of course, climate or enforced attention to climate, but I would say the major novelty is that it's not only the climate, it's also the rest of the environment, and especially nature and biodiversity on equal ground as a joint undertaking if we want to solve the ecological crisis we are facing. But also very importantly, the Green Deal is not only a climate and environment strategy, it is also explicitly an economic strategy tapping from the potential of going ahead on environment and climate. It's also a social strategy, by the way, with this sense of a fair transition. So having this elements, a code like this one, joining industry and nature protection goes pretty much in the sense of what we see as the philosophy of the Green Deal. I need to add a bit more on one of the major deliverables of the Green Deal, the one I follow more closely, which is the European Biodiversity Strategy to 2030, that I do think it's quite an ambitious strategy, maybe the, the most ambitious the world has yet seen, pretty much fueled by the Green Deal and by the sense of a EU that um, should lead by example. And for those that could think, oh yeah, but uh, that was before COVID, wasn't it? No. No, it was actually approved amidst the pandemics and confinement, and it's an element of the recovery. We want this commission to push nature investments, biodiversity investments, as a fundamental element for a healthy recovery. We won't be healthy without a healthy nature, and we all know how much of, uh, of zoonotic diseases risks exist if we keep mingling too much with nature, not giving it uh, space enough. 
Now, of course, I won't pass to review the strategy, but it's a very, it has quite a broad scope because it aims to address the main drivers of biodiversity loss. So we have measures for a bit of everything, including binding targets to come to restore nature, which are uh, deliverable. We are working right now. We aim to increase the level of protection of London Sea in the EU up to 30%. We also aim to improve the status, the conservation status of protected habitats and species. And here's a link with the code of conduct. We want to reduce pollution to help green the cities, improve farming and fishing practices and so forth. So all this says there's a push that comes from the Green Deal and is materialized in the biodiversity strategy and what follows from it towards putting Europe in a path of recovery by 2030 and beyond. Now, as regards this specific topic of species protection, I also want to highlight we are doing other deliverables coming. For instance, very recently, the Commission has issued its guidance document on the strict protection of animal species under the Habitats Directive, which updates and replaces uh, uh, guidance from 2007. I do think it has a good potential to help everyone from member states to stakeholders on understanding and improving the implementation of directive because it builds on a lot of practical experience and knowledge developed uh, for, a, for a long time now. Um, so I think this, um, this, um, this guidance, by the way, this guidance also covers or the so-called temporary nature, so a situation where there was a recolonization of species and how to deal with it, which can also be useful in the context of extractive industry. But I do trust that these two new, two new instruments, the code launched today, plus this updated guidance, can contribute to strengths and efforts to, to restore nature and to deal uh, and to indeed to improve coexistence with wildlife or nature. That's what we want. We have more uh, guidance, um, both in the pipeline or delivered. For instance, we have recently updated the general guidelines on appropriate assessments of plans and projects affecting Natura 2000 sites, another element that I think is rather useful. It builds on 20 years of experience, all the guidance, of course, in conformity with the EU Court of Justice uh, judgments. And we have also um, instruments that build on existing sector-specific guidance, such as the guidance of 2010, the Commission guidance on non-energy mineral extraction and Natura 2000. So again, we do have some elements, and I'm sure your code of conduct for sure has taken that into account, that were designed and are designed to help this harmony uh, of sectors, your sector particularly with nature. Actually, the final conference of the project Life Inquiries has just provided an excellent example on how extractive activities can go hand in hand with the EU nature conservation objectives, including species protection. The way I like to put it, of course, extractive industry has an impact. It extracts after all. But we can conceive it as something that gives back in the end. We can, after the extraction, with appropriate planning and intervention, create habitat, new habitats, new occasions for species recovery. That's pretty much what we aim nowadays, is an economic activity that gives more than what it extracts, even if other formats. Um, and I think this is a rather important point, which is we do face an ecological crisis in the world, and Europe is not a bubble outside the ecological crisis. All the data we have show, for instance, on species decline, the State of Nature's report, the latest one, is very clear. Most of it, including sp protected species, several are in, in bad shape. And uh, so this does need an integrative approach where we do not look only to the species as such, we don't, not, don't look only to the emissions as such. We need in, an integrated approach on dealing to this. And this key word of a regenerative economy, that's the one that will fly. The economy that, yes, produces value, but in the end, the environment gets better through appropriate planning and action. And that's, it. And that's how I like to look to this code and that, uh, what it aims at. So finally, and in this spirit, I uh, encourage you all the signatories of this code to reinforce efforts to address biodiversity in the sense of the code and, if I may, a bit beyond. We also have now many businesses 
which are acting for nature, not just because of the sake of nature, but for their own sake, those that understand that their risks and dependencies, if they want to keep the business going, needs to look into, well, natural capital and how to account for natural capital. So I also call upon your industries to take a, a look into these pledges and these many initiatives that aim to look at nature as uh, not any longer as a nuisance out there, but as a solution provider and something that in, indeed ensures the sustainability of the sectors themselves. Thank you very much. I'll stay here. Thank you very much, Humberto. It was fantastic to have you frame the code in light of the, of the EU biodiversity strategy. So, so thank you for that. And, and thank you for our next challenge that you've laid down. So um, I think this, this is a good start, a really good start for how the sector um, can work together to really put, put nature back into our landscapes. Um, and uh, certainly, I think a lot, of, a lot of the companies and the associations are starting to look, really look at, at their impacts and dependencies. And um, this is, yeah, step one on, on the road to that. So thank you very much. Much. So, um, we've been talking about this code. Humberto's put it into context, but, but you may all be wondering, well, what is this code? What, what does it mean? What is it? Well, what's the content? So, I would now like to invite Ariel Brunner, who's the uh, head of, uh, Senior Head of Policy at BirdLife Europe, uh, to come and join me, um, and we'll just have a discussion about what, what this code actually is. So, Ariel, if I can ask you, um, the code really looks to guide certain economic activities so that they can actually be in harmony with species protection and actually the active quarry can actually support species protection. Now, um, we think of active quarries, we think of big trucks. We think of species, very tiny. You think they may not actually go together. And, and BirdLife Europe is very much about lobbying for species protection, that businesses work responsibly. So what was the motivation for you getting involved with the, with the sector around such a delicate topic? Well, our motivation is that, uh, of course, uh, quarries can have big impacts. You dig a big hole in the ground. Well, you know, if there's stuff living on it, it's going to be a problem. But quarries can also produce, they do produce uh, very, very important habitats, um, particularly uh, temporary wetlands, dry grasslands, cliffs, habitats that, by the way, in the more heavily uh, uh, impacted bits of our continent have often disappeared. So you have species uh, like the sand martin, it's a swallow that nests, used to nest in the banks of rivers, a lot of the rivers in this part of the world have become canals, and it's something we need to start changing. Um, but today, a lot of those um, uh, little swallows nest in the piles of sand or, or, or sand cliffs that you find in, in quarries. So quarries can be bad for biodiversity, they can be good for biodiversity. We, of course, want them to be good for biodiversity. And the issue is that we have very good legislation in Europe, uh, the Birds and Habitats Directives, that protect species. In its implementation, often there have been misunderstandings, problems, and we've had that in all sorts of strange situations. So the idea was to sit together with the industry and see how can we uh, give industry a tool to respect the law, respect life, and still do their economic activity for which they exist. Thank you. Yes, no, I think um, certainly from uh, working with industry myself, um, there's a great concern that uh, we could accidentally squash the species as, as we drive our trucks around the quarry. Um, we all know the, the dangers of, of stockpiles, particularly of, of sands and gravels. Um, uh, we had a particular example where, um, you know, San Martins can move in overnight. Um, and it was a real worry for us. And I, I know a lot of quarries in many countries have just kept their, kept their quarries bare. They didn't want these species coming in. Um, and so, yes, we've been working on this solution, which is great. Um, now, the solution is uh, based on, on um, the legalities um, and in harmony with the EU directives. I was wondering if you could just describe exactly how the code works um, and, and what, what the mechanism is that, that would potentially yeah. allow... So basically, uh, of course, we, we start from you know, the legislation and indeed the guidance already provided, uh, the more generic guidance by, provided by, by the Commission. But we have been arguing for a lot of time that we need actually to go sector specific because 
general guidance is general. Uh, you need to know exactly what to do. So, uh, in a nutshell, first of all, we say that it's really important to distinguish the three stages in the life of a quarry. So, the first clearing of habitats in order to uh, start the works, the management of those temporary habitats within the quarry, and then uh, the reclamation uh, work. Um, and in all three stages, it's re really about saying what are the good practices that you need to do in order to avoid squashing those vulnerable species and uh, asking for derogations from the public authorities uh, for those unavoid unavoidable impacts in a mitigation hierarchy logic where you really try to avoid doing the damage. And if you have to do some damage, then at least you declare it, you monitoring, you make sure that it doesn't have a negative conservation impact and you get a permit for it. And then of course, we would like to see uh, authorities embracing it so that this is done in a way that is not um, kind of bureaucratic and about ticking boxes, but is really about achieving the conservation impact. Because the worst that we can have is the situation where quarry managers maintain the place completely sterile with no life on it and periodically get a fine because they've, they've overlooked something. Where we want to be is a place where the quarry manager has a plan, takes the biodiversity uh, in consideration, does all the things it needs to do to avoid them, monitors what happens, and then has a piece of paper from the authorities that say that if he does all those, she does all those right things, then they are okay legally. So that's a bit what, uh, what, uh, what the code tries, uh, tries to do. And we have zoomed in on a few of the more typical problems, uh, whether it's the St. Martins, whether it's the amphibians that go breeding in the puddles where you have heavy machinery that uh, risks going and, and so on. Perfect. I think biodiversity can be quite a complex topic for the quarry staff to understand, um, particularly around the, the breeding seasons. They don't always know that certain species will arrive in one month and the next. So I think this, this idea of having this plan that they can work to, um, and I think the, the way that the code really picks up on these specific species groups, which, which kind of brings, brings biodiversity down into a very tangible um, uh, sort of definition for them to be able to follow, I, I think is really great. Um, and also I, I think that the, the management plan also is a really good way of um, improving communication with the authorities, with NGOs and with the communities. Is, is this something that, that you... Uh, absolutely, and that's, uh, that's what we need. I mean, we need everybody to be doing their share. So we need the companies to uh, take biodiversity seriously and educate their staff and put the plans uh, in, in place and build it into the way they do the business. It really should be, it's like health and safety. You know, it should be in the list of the things that you need to check. We need authorities uh, to first of all do their job in terms of setting federal fer conservation status, monitoring species and so on. Um, you can do the right things at a quarry level if the state does things properly at a higher level. Otherwise, it's in isolation and it becomes meaningless. And authorities do also need to create smarter systems of managing licenses and derogations so that they are, on the one hand, really strict and really adhering to the law, but also feasible and manageable for those uh, companies that really uh, want to do things right. In too many places in Europe, we see uh, a tendency by authorities to be very stiff with the people that respect the law and turn a blind eye from the people who break the law. And we need to go to a situation where you are absolutely ruthless with those that break the law and you make respecting the law easy. Yeah, yeah, I think um, there's a lot of uh, sometimes fear around derogations because of the long paperwork that's involved, the uncertainty, um, that the time and money that, that could be spent on, on just moving three great crested dutes, for example. And that's, I think, one of the central messages of, uh, of uh, also the Code of Conduct is uh, 
we don't want to be in a world where every time you move a piece of machinery, you need to ask for a permit for the newt. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for anyone, including the newts. What we need is uh, a situation where you come with a plan. In that plan, you have de facto a risk assessment where you say, those are the things that I might be damaging. That's what I'm doing to avoid damaging them. Is that okay? And then the public authority takes the responsibility to say, yes, it's okay. If you do those things, then you are allowed to potentially, because obviously if you create a habitat for amphibians, you can try to avoid uh, running your tracks in certain places, in certain times of the year, in certain times of the day, <laughs> in certain meteorological situations, but sooner or later you will run over a toad. But for an amphibian population, that's not necessarily uh, a problem. Very often those pioneer species are species that in nature would have high mortality and high reproductive levels. So the problem is about doing things in conscience and in knowledge. And if you do things in conscience and in knowledge in line with the law, then you should be protected from you know, uh, having to pay fines for things that you could not really avoid. Great, thank you. Well, I know that um, we've, we've been working on this code for a number of years. Um, we're so excited that, that it's uh, now in print and, and being launched today. Um, do you think this is, uh, well, two questions really. Firstly, what are the next steps now we have this in place? And secondly, how do you think uh, this concept of NGO industry supported by the Commission could actually be exported to other sectors? Yeah. So for this sector and for this code of conduct, what we need now is really a pedagogic exercise. We need this embraced by particularly by national, national and regional authorities, because ultimately they are the ones that need to do it. And of course, by the industry and by NGOs and by scientists and everybody else. Um, we need to get more situations where people sit together and try concretely to solve the problems within the framework of the law. Um, I also think that this is showing the way for other sectors, um, and I'm particularly happy about this because we are hearing too many sectors that are in state of denial about the crisis of biodiversity. In agriculture, in forestry, it's, it's terrible. Uh, you know, ma main players in the industry has still not accepted that they actually have a problem. We hear a lot of people, you know, complaining that uh, nature conservation is bureaucratic, it's red tape. We need to move beyond that. And I think this is a sector that is quite seriously trying to move beyond this kind of bitching stage into saying, yes, there are problems. Yes, we are part of the problems. Yes, we can be part of the solutions and let's see concretely how we can do it. And this needs to happen ultimately with the whole economy and it needs to happen very fast. And uh, we uh, repeat our appeal to the commission, which we made uh, already a few years ago. Um, the commission need to work with us, with others, to develop this sort of guidance tailored for, se for sectors, because the problems you have on a quarry are not the same that you have in a forest. They are not the same that you have in a farm. They are not the same that you have in a shipping lane and so on and so forth. Um, the commission has done it already uh, on, for example, the guidance on Natura 2000 sites where they have gone sectoral. And I think it has done a lot of good. I think with species protection, that's another area where we need to zoom in and I think that the uh, um, logic of codes of conduct uh, is, uh, is absolutely exportable. Um, you know, if you want to avoid destroying nests when you cut trees, well, you need to avoid cutting trees during the breeding season. So there are, uh, there are things that you can do to avoid having uh, that sort of damage. And if you put those things into kind of standardized procedures, you can, you can also standardize the approach to derogations and you can end up with a system that is both stricter in terms of control of, of real uh, damage on biodiversity and more flexible and secure for uh, the economic operators. 
Thank you. Well, I think um, I'm, I'm sure the industry doesn't mind me speaking on, on their behalf, but I think we're, we're very proud to have this leading role that, that we've created here with the code. And um, I think for, for our sector, we're, we're very mature in working with, with NGOs and, and we certainly would call on other businesses to, to really go down this route. I mean, we, we had a real headache problem um, and we've been able to work uh, with, with BirdLife um, to actually come up with a solution that, that really puts us in a strong place to, to help, help halt biodiversity loss and, and really put something back. So thank you so much, Ariel, for, for joining me. Um, I don't know if you want to say a closing word. No, th thank you. Um, I think thanks to the, to the industry associations, also to Heidelberg that has uh, helped a lot in, in making this happen. Um, and I would really hope that you can uh, also bring the word out in the business community uh, to other sectors, because uh, very often, you know, businesses see us as troublemakers and so on. I think they need to hear it from business that, you know, the fight to save life on earth is something that they really need to embrace and that embracing it is not that horrible experience at the end of the day. Great. Thank you very much, Ariel. Thank you. Welcome. So this, this is the famous code. Um, and for those that are joining us virtually, um, there will be a link that's put in the, the chat box so that you'll be able to directly download it um, and um, hopefully wait till the end of the end of the event before you start reading. But um, there we go. In, enjoy that afterwards. But of course, we need to officially introduce it and launch it. So um, I'm very happy to welcome the uh, uh, respective partners up to sign, uh, sign the document. So if I can um, start with BirdLife as the first signature, if I can invite you up to sign the document on behalf of BirdLife, that would be fantastic. Um, followed by uh, Sembureau, if I can invite you up also. And then Eurogypsum. No, no, I think you, you see, where do we, uh, because that's us. That's oh, yours. That, it's, okay. That's okay. Yeah. Just in the white box. Thank you. Perfect, okay. Eurogypsum. It's been a lot of hard work from all the partners to get to this point, so it's fantastic to see these signatures. Nicola, if I can invite you up on behalf of Heidelberg Cement. Perfect. And lastly, UEPG. If I could just ask you to step back and we'll take a, a picture of, uh, perfect, take a picture of the, the signing parties. Lovely, thank you. If I can ask you to return to your seats, apart from UEPG, so if I can invite Antonio, Ant sorry, Antonis, Antonio Latouris, president of UEPG, um, up to the podium to say a few words about um, the part you played and, and what you think of the code. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Actually, currently we are signing a, a code of contact which in my opinion, it stems from a code of honor. And what do we mean by code of honor, ladies and gentlemen? In its simplest form, a code of honor is, is a set of ethical principles based on common ideals that define what uh, constitutes honorable behavior. And in order to be more simple, it is our organization's mutual agreement to abide to ethical behavior, a behavior which is to the best interest of all, both the animals and the humans. And yes, as UEPG, the European Aggregates Association, we are really very happy and very proud of being here today among like-minded people 
who care about our planet in order to set the rules, the norms, the responsibilities, the proper practices of how the extractive industry can coexist with nature conservation. And ladies and gentlemen, biodiversity, we can say, underpins our human prosperity. But on the other hand, there are recent studies and recent reports, both within but outside also European Union, which show that biodiversity continues to decline at an alarming rate, we can say. And therefore, we want to emphasize that humanity, humanity has to be grateful for organizations like Bert Life, who care for those that have no voice to protest. And in general, the co-signing and the, and the implementation of this code of contact shows exactly how the extractive sector cares about biodiversity. Because at the end of the day, we are all in the same boat. We inhabit the same planet. We breathe the same air. And therefore, we all must combine forces, minds, ideas, in order to make sure that we preserve our planet. We, the, the extractive sector people, probably we are the unlucky ones because we are considered to be the bad guys. Even though we provide humanity with essential products that build our economies by helping erecting such buildings we are in today, even though the, the extractive operations are considered to be a threat to the environment, I want to emphasize something well known to all, to all, that without aggregates, without cement, without gypsum, there would be literally nothing around us. This is a reality. On the other hand, case studies, after case studies, and we have we have a, a section on our website as UEPG where we have hundreds of such cases show with scientific evidence that biodiversity increases both in existing active quarries as well as in the rehabilitated ones. But of course, this doesn't mean that our responsibilities and the combined efforts with all the organizations that are here today or all those that might come in the future in our alliance, stop here. On the contrary, we are here today signing this code of contact because we want it to serve as a code of honor. We are here today because we care also about this planet. We are here today because we also care about those that have no voice to protest. But we are also here today because we want to serve both flora and fauna as well as humankind. And it is understandable, but quite often not persistible, that without aggregates, cement and gypsum, we cannot enjoy our daily lives we enjoy today. And to put it simpler, we cannot even have a shelter over our head. This is a reality. But on the other hand, we have to take care also about nature, about biodiversity, and this is our milestone as an industry. In the, in the prefaces of this code of contact, on page three, on second column, second paragraph, if I may read it, it says, as a solution, we, a consortium of Semberu, Eurogyp, Sub UEPG, and BertLife Europe and Central Asia, supported by Heidelberg Cement, have developed new guidance for a management of temporary habitats linked to the extractive sector, creating a win win for business and for nature. I only would like to add to this the following. As a solution, we have developed new guidance for the management of temporary habitats linked to the extractive sector, creating a win-win 
for business and for nature, as well as for mankind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Antonis, for those very inspirational words. Thank you very much. Um, and next, I would like to uh, call up, uh, let me get this right. So, Emmanuel Numont, president from Eurogypsum, if you could come up and, and say a few words. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today for the launch of such an important document. And it has been said already, today's launch is particularly timely with the issuance of uh, the European Commission's guidance on the strict protection of animal species under the Habitat Directive just a few weeks ago. It may often sound unusual for construction product manufacturer industries like the uh, gypsum and plaster sector to speak on topics related to biodiversity and ecosystems. People don't necessarily associate the buildings of their home with animals' habitats. However, we all know here there is such a link. Actually, an industry supply and processing a mineral, gypsum, we interact on a daily basis with ecosystem in our quarries. This interaction is first aimed at managing and reducing the adverse impact of industrial activities when they occur. This impact is rather limited when it comes to the gypsum sector. Our industry has effectively engaged to reduce the environmental impact of its operations. And we are committed to reduce it further in line with EU and national legislations. Most importantly, the Habitats and Birds Directive. By protecting species, rehabilitating quarries after use, but also enabling this temporary nature during extraction. This brings me to the second dimension of our interaction with ecosystems and biodiversity less known to the larger public, namely the multiple opportunities offered by extractive in, uh, sites such as gypsum quarries to create new and diverse habitats. Quarries very often offer the possibility to promote biodiversity by generating diversified biotopes for rare and endangered species of amphibians, reptiles, insects, birds, flowers, and plants. These animals and vegetal species seek refuge in former and existing quarries when they are well managed with the use of temporary biotopes, for instance, temporary ponds. Eurogypsum has actually developed an interactive map of Europe on its website with examples of projects contributing to the protection and enhancement of biodiversity. This project shows the importance of ensuring a sustainable management of quarries. And thirdly, beyond the extensive and useful legislative framework at EU and national levels to protect species, the commitment from interested parties to go the extra mile and to join forces is what can make the difference. Dialogue, cooperation with stakeholders are key elements of success. Each of our quarry managers knows it from their daily interaction with local communities and representatives from political, academic, and civil society organizations. Today's launch is a clear signal in that direction. So I really, I'd like to, congrat con to congratulate sorry, representatives from BirdLife Europe and the EU extractive industries for the work carried out in defining a meaningful code of conduct, which will guide the whole sector towards better practices in the interest of biodiversity. And I also welcome the support given by the European Commission for this document. 
which is much appreciated. We all, we all have our part to play to have a dynamic ecosystems and dynamic economies. As a European gypsum sector, we see it as our social and ethical responsibility to shape our customers' quality of life, providing everyone with sustainable building materials for the places they live or spend time in, but also ensuring that we are not degrading the environment we all live in. We are glad to be part of these initiatives and we will promote the code and its implementation throughout Europe in the more than 150 gypsum quarries. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much, Muriel. Um, I just want to pick up on that going extra mile. I think that's a fantastic phrase. And I think for, for us all to collectively um, su support the reversal of biodiversity loss, to really do something for the biodiversity crisis, I think we all, all need to go the extra mile. So thank you very much. Um, we have a change in representation from SEM Bureau. Um, so can I invite uh, Rob Vandermeer, who's the Industrial Policy Director for SEM Bureau, to, to speak on their behalf. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Caroline, and uh, thank you for inviting Sembirov to participate in this event. And indeed, I have a little bit to explain. Due to family reasons, our president is not able to come. And due to other family reasons, our CEO was also not able to come. And then they asked me to do this. And that is a little bit remarkable to say it, because at the start of this code of conduct, I was involved from another position. And so I know much more about the code of conduct and the development and also the difficulties in this code of conduct than many other participants and people in the audience. That doesn't change anything on the content because it's a beautiful document. First, I'm representing Sembro in this uh, group. Sembro is the uh, official representative of the cement industry in Europe including Turkey, Norway, and Switzerland, very important countries also because of the biodiversity issues. And Sembro is, of course, an association like UPG and Europe Gibson, uh, a little bit different because we cover another sector, but for the rest, uh, identical. Green Deal of Europe, the Green Deal that has been launched uh, some time ago by the European Commission is putting a lot of efforts, a lot of resources from industry to yeah, to how to say it, to, to fulfill the ambitions that is coming from Brussels, from Brussels and to make it a package that helps industry to be in Europe in the front row of the discussions. And for us as cement industry, the climate package, the Fit for 55 package is today a very important topic, but also the biodiversity and uh, biodiversity strategy is an important topic that we want to cover in our activities. And for that reason, um, we see an opportunity here. By diversity and quarries, it was mentioned already by Ariel just before, digging big holes and then doing something in these big holes, how to combine that with biodiversity, and we know that that is possible. It is about protect and preserve, preservation of species in our quarries during the lifetime of the quarries, but also after the lifetime of the quarries, and that is an important issue. It is about rehabilitation of quarries. And at the end, I have to say, it is about adding biodiversity somehow, stopping the loss of biodiversity in Europe with, I can't say it in another way, the help of the cement industry. Cement industry is essential for Europe. We need it. We need cement, we need concrete, we need gypsum, we need the aggregate from UPG. We all need that for our society, but we also need to work on that biodiversity issue. And when you look at biodiversity, you have to really think about the life cycle of a quarry, digging a hole. But in that hole, during the time of excavation of the minerals, limestone for cement industry especially, sometimes clay, one of the issues is that you can create temporary nature areas, places where temporary nature is having a sort of freedom, adding value to the biodiversity and how to take care of that is part of this code of conduct. And I think that is an important one. The nice thing about this code of conduct, and I said I was at the start already present, um, this is the result of the leading role of two 
partners in this discussion. From one side, an NGO, BirdLife International, active, approaching sectors, approaching companies, working on biodiversity. And on the other hand, Heidelberg Cement, working in the same uh, area, working also on biodiversity, having ideas how to work on that temporary nature, on the life cycle of quarries, and coming together with the result of this code of conduct, supported by the European Commission. Thank you very much. It is much appreciated. I think that without your support, the value of this document is less, but this is a major step and supported by the associations, and SEMBRO is one of these associations. It is a productive collaboration of these sectors and NGOs, and at the end, the Commission. A nice thing about this, I see it is, this is beyond the obligations coming from the biodiversity strategy. It's much more, it's a positive approach. And we can tell stories with beautiful pictures, like message uh, by you as president of UPG, we have beautiful examples. And I can guarantee you, when you go into a quarry and see what is happening, that is really amazing. When you see an uh, Uhu flying close to you, and I've seen that several times, that is something you should see in our quarries. So with that, I want to conclude my input to this discussion. The code of conduct is a very positive element on biodiversity of the sectors that we have here at the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. And um, we were very sad that, the, that your president couldn't be here, but I think it was very fitting that you could join us to say a few words, having such a personal attachment to this code as well. And thank you also for painting that beautiful image, that picture of the life actually living in the quarries. Um, I think eagle owls are, are one of the species in Europe that really are benefiting from, uh, from the extractive sites, having those cliffs to then nest in. So thank you very much, Rob. So you've, you've heard about the code, um, you've heard from, from the associations, and um, I want to thank the associations for, for supporting this and, and, and having a few words today. Um, but we're going to go back to the Mentimeter now. Um, we have another question for you to, to make sure that you're still still active participant. Um, and the question is, what are the key advantages of the code in your view? Um, firstly, to raise awareness. So um, as you can see here today, um, this really has helped talk about the, the topic of biodiversity, particularly within our sector. Secondly, to improve stakeholder communications. Again, an example of us working with, with an NGO. Or third, to set clear goals for industry. Um, and uh, particularly that's interesting in terms of other sectors. So if you could vote A, B or C. Nice, and we can see the results by what you voted in the first question. So clear goals for the industry, that's nice. And that, that's really fitting actually with, with the policy developments that are happening at the moment. Um, certainly in terms of, again, understanding our impact and dependency, coming up with actual targets and measurements of how we bi measure biodiversity. I think the code is a, is a step forward to help us support, support with that. Great, thank you, thank you. That's, that's really, and I think this is also um, a, a real call to other sectors. This is obviously helping our sector in understanding biodiversity um, in our operations. It's helping us understand how to manage that better. And again, another call to, to other sectors, to other businesses to, to take inspiration from this and, and look at how, how this could be replicated in, in your area. Thank you very much. So as we, as we draw to a close, um, uh, you've heard Heidelberg Cement mentioned a few times today, um, and um, we're very proud that, that we started off this initiative with BirdLife. Um, and I would like to hand the floor to Dr. Nicola Kim, who is our Chief Sustainability Officer at Heidelberg Cement, just to say a few closing thoughts from, from this event. Thanks, Carolyn. So first I'd like to express my thanks to DG Environment, uh, BirdLife and the associations for your inspiring words. And thank you all for joining today at this important event. So I'd like to start off with um, a little bit of uh, context uh, around Heidelberg Cement. 
Um, so we're one of the world's largest um, manufacturing companies in the building sector, uh, producing products like cement, concrete and aggregates. Uh, environmental responsibility is critical to our actions. And that's why sustainability and our sustainable, con our sustainable commitments and our sustainable policies focus very much around environmental protection. Several years ago, we identified the problem that opportunities for nature conservation during the active phase of a quarry were restricted due to legal constraints around protected species. This was a missed opportunity for wildlife, but also presented a risk for our operations. At the time, we were encouraged by the emerging concept of temporary nature and early findings from the EU-funded project Life in Quarries. So in 2018, together with BirdLife, we set about to develop a solution that would enable temporary habitats in active quarries without a legal risk to our activities. Three years later, we're proud to see the launch of this code of conduct, and the, we have the full support of the European non-energy extractive sector and the European Commission. The code of conduct and the reference to temporary habitats in extraction sites in the EU guidance on the strict protection of species are essential first steps in creating an enabling environment. During the Life in Quarries conference and site visits today and yesterday, many of you had the opportunity to experience firsthand how we can incorporate space for nature alongside active operations. You can see how the temporary ponds at our quarry, quarry in Kinast, developed through the Life Funded Project, provide crucial breeding habitats for natterjack toads. This is a perfect example of how we can bring this code of conduct to life. I'd like to thank everyone for their contributions to make this pivotal moment for business and biodiversity possible. But now let's put it into practice, mainstream the code across member states and take the next steps in driving action on the ground. Thank you. Now back over to Karen. So Nicola set the scene very well there at the end. It's all now about what we do with it. We have the code, that's fantastic, but I think we all play a part in, in promoting this, um, in, in working with the, with the member states to actually mainstream this, to, to really get it, get it deep into, into operational activity. Um, and it's great to see that, that this is already starting. So in Germany, um, the concept of, of temporary nature has been uh, adopted into law. They're now working on, of course, the, the details, but that's a fantastic first step to, to really support biodiversity within active quarries. Um, I think when the, the communities, um, external stakeholders often struggle with, with the, the concept of biodiversity in quarries, um, I think we've done lots of work on the, the restoration side, so what can we put back post quarrying? But I think this is a great step in actually opening people's eyes to the fact that it's not just after, but, but during that, that we can support nature. So that just leaves me to wrap up with lots of thank yous. Um, so firstly, um, a huge thank you to BirdLife Europe um, for your support. Um, you've been instrumental in, in supporting us with this and, and thank you for your open-mindedness in, 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 in that support. Um, secondly, I would like to very much thank the associations. Um, and for me personally, it's great to see the three associations working together. We all have different products at the end of the day, but it's all holes in the ground. Um, so it's really, and the, the, the nature doesn't care whether the quarry is going for cement or, or for aggregate. So it's really good to see that collaborative working across associations. Um, I would also thank very much the Commission because this is this really underpins the, the importance of this document and I'm very grateful for you to join us today. Much appreciated. Um, and um, uh, gosh, who am I forgetting? A big thank you to Shane Sparg from BirdLife Europe who's been instrumental to the organization of this. Um, uh, I think we're, we, everyone's learnt a lot in event planning. So um, thank you so much, Shane, and thank you very much to, to the venue and, and Annie at the, the agency that's been, been supporting us. So I hope you I hope you've enjoyed the celebrations. Like I say, the the link is there for those that um, are joining virtually. For those that are here in person, we have a copy. You are not allowed to leave without a copy. You can even take a few. Um, and so um, yeah, just to say again, 
Thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions on the code, uh, there are contact details on, on the, uh, the inside page. So feel free to reach out to any of us and we're happy to answer your questions. Um, and what I can say is go forth and promote. So thank you very much. Um, and hopefully see, speak, um, be online with you all soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>